Thank you. Let's see if I can get this on. Let's see if I got this. Oh, good. Last time I had one of these, it didn't work out too well. Um, hi, you guys. It's really nice to be here for like the 13th year in a row. Uh, no, actually not in a row. We missed one summer camp, uh, and my kids almost killed us and said, never again, even though we went to the States, we went to California, but they said it wasn't worth it. They can't miss another <laughs> summer camp because we think it's like the highlight of our summer. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start off by first putting my timer on so that I don't go over and make sure the volume is down so it doesn't, like, scare us. Okay, so how many of you have slept tonight? Raise your hand. So my hand is not up. <laughs> A lot of your hands are up. But uh, yesterday, I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I would probably freak you out. But uh, those of you that already know are probably already laughing. I see some of you. Uh, so yesterday I was feeling really like, like I had this cloud like over me, you know, like when you're de dehydrated. So I, w I was feeling fine, but I just had this like cloud around my eyes. And so someone, some nice gentleman tells me, well, you know, you should go take a salt shot. And I'm like, a salt shot? Okay, you probably need salt because the water is not absorbing in your body. So I'm like, okay, a salt shot. Okay, I'm going to go take a salt shot. Well, the way that I am, I have to like overdo everything. So... Uh, I'm supposed to take this much, much salt, but instead I take like this much salt in my cup and I just drink it and the salt doesn't go down, so I put a little bit more water in it and drink it again and I drink way too much salt. So like it only took five minutes and by the time I had left our caravan, my stomach was just going <laughs> And the whole day yesterday, I was having problems with my stomach. I thought it was, yeah, no, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, yeah, it was not a good day. So last night as I'm sleeping in the caravan, I had to get up like three times. So I didn't sleep very much, plus I was fighting with my 12-year-old over our blanket. And you never win when you fight with a 12-year-old over a blanket, so that's how my morning has been, or my night has been. Uh, but anyway, I'm here, I'm standing, and I'm awake. Oh, one more thing. If my husband runs up here and takes over, you know why. Because I have to run to the bathroom. But I, I think I'll be fine. Uh, okay, so I am <laughs> hoping that's not going to happen. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about my life. Okay, because people like don't, a lot of you know because I talk a lot. But um, uh, some of you don't know my background. So I was born October 2nd, 1975. So you have to do the math. I'm not going to tell you. I, I never know how old I am. I'm always asking Henrik, am I 42? Am I 43? I don't remember. One time I was 30. This is not in my notes. I, I was 32, I think, and I was at my mother-in-law's house, and she said, isn't your birthday next week? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, how old will you be? And I'm like, 25. And she goes, 25? And I go, yeah, 25. And she starts laughing because she thinks I'm joking. And I was serious. I was like, yo, I'm going to be 25. <laughs> And she goes, no, you're going to be like 30-something. And I was like, oh, my gosh, where did time go? <laughs> I have no idea what happened. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm 40-something. So I was born in Mountain View, California. To You can show the first, I think it's my mom and dad on the first. There. That's my mom and dad. And they might be watching, so hi, mom and dad. And praying for me. Thank you very much. So uh, I was born to 21-year-old uh, hippie parents, uh, uh, born in Mountain View, California, beautiful, beautiful place. And this is actually my parents on their probably second missionary trip to, to Hawaii. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a missionary trip to Hawaii? And they, I was like one year, maybe, maybe two years old uh, while they're on their Hawaii missionary trip, and they left me with my grandmother, and when they came home, I totally knobbed them. I was like, uh-uh, I'm not going to you. You left me, you went to Hawaii, no thank you. But I did eventually go back with them. Um, so anyway, when I was about three, I think the next picture is me. We moved to Texas. <laughs> we moved to Texas when I was about three, and my parents, um, I forgot to tell you, they were hippie Jesus lovers. Uh, 
my dad got saved when he was about 17, radically saved. And my mom had given her life to Jesus when she was a small child. Uh, so anyway, we moved to Texas, Texarkana, Texas, and my parents worked with a the church there, um, just leaders in the church. And I lived there until I was 16 years old. And when I was 16 years old, we moved as a family. My brother was born within that time. Uh, he's nine years, seven years younger than I am. Uh, we moved to Bulgaria. So I was a 16-year-old. I think the next picture is, oh, no, this is me in Texas with the big hair. I think I'm 13, and I'm looking hot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't you love the hair? Do you remember? Any of you? Do you remember? You push it down, and it pops right back up. <laughs> You had to take the blow dryer and lots of hairspray and try to get, okay. Anyway, um, so, yeah. But the next picture is Bulgaria. No, the next picture is Istanbul, but like on our way to Bulgaria. So this is my family, and this is when we were going to be moving to Bulgaria from Texas, a 16-year-old leaving everything. Crazy. But probably one of the most uh, wonderful times of my life also. So I actually, I shouldn't be saying this, because teenagers are here. Hi, I see you guys. Um, I actually kind of dropped out of school. Uh, I know, it was horrible. Uh, but I was supposed to be homeschooling, but there was so much fun stuff to do in Bulgaria. I, I started traveling, and I was um, like going with different groups to like gy gypsy areas, and we would sing songs, and we'd pray for people, and it was just really, really cool. So my dad was like, okay. You know, you can go back and get your GED. Uh, this is really important stuff, and it's good stuff. And I tried to homeschool as much as I could, but it was just kind of boring. But I really do like school now. So I, I really, like, I'm like going, is there anything else I can study? Can, can I just get another degree? I would really like to if I had more time. Um, so I'm off my notes really bad. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yes. So I lived there for three years. And um, then left my family because they, were, they stayed in Bulgaria, but I wanted to go to university. So I moved to southern Texas, southern, southern Texas, like 10 minutes from the Mexican border, uh, a place called Edinburgh, Texas, really close to McAllen, which has been in the news. Some of you have probably heard about it. But um, anyway, that's not relevant. So I was there about a year and a half, two years maybe, and then I moved, and then I went on vacation to Sweden. Uh, strange, but we knew people in Bulgaria that was, were Swedish, and so I went with them on vacation to Sweden. And I was in Sweden for three weeks. The last four days of my vacation, I met my husband. And I ended up staying six weeks, and then two months later, I moved to Sweden. And two years later, we got married. <laughs> so it was very fast. It was love at first sight for Henrik. <laughs> for me, it took two days. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It's really true, actually. <laughs> That's even his story. Um, so, we got married. Uh, we lived in Sweden for about... Uh, oh, yeah, there we are. Well, it's a really bad picture. I got it off of Facebook because I didn't have... But it, that's like, that was our first in love picture together. That was that first summer. Um, yes, so we got married. And then we decided we were going to move to the States because my husband is a forester and he got a job there. So it wasn't because of me. I had actually a good job in, in Sweden. But uh, we ended up moving to uh, Wisconsin, Superior, Wisconsin, which is very close to Duluth, Minnesota. And in Duluth, Minnesota, there is a really awesome church, uh, a vineyard church. And that was our very first vineyard experience in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, and we had our first child there, Julia, who is 18 years old, and she is not with us today. Do I, did I have a family picture? Yes, there's my family. This is Henrik Emanuel. He's 12. He's here. He's at the Tweens. Uh, me, Martina, she's there. She is uh, 16, right? Uh, and Julia. 
<laughs> Age is just hard for me. <laughs> uh, Julia, she's 18, and her and her friend Nadine, they are in Texas right now. So they're at a summer camp, going to work for about four weeks, and that's really cool. And I just want to tell you, I'm really going off, but I just want to tell you this one little story because she's never been to Texas. Yeah, she's been to Texas. She was nine months old when she was in Texas, but that was a long time ago. Uh, so she's in Texas, and it's their first two days in Texas, and they're staying at a lake. This is before the camp that they're going to be working at has opened up. So they're, they're just, you know, relaxing. It's a beautiful lake. They're, they're in Livingston, Texas. And uh, there's the sun's going down, and they're like, oh, let's go out and take, like Swedes do, uh, a night dip. What is it called? <laughs> go take a bath, uh, go swimming at night. Anyway, so they go out and they swim, and it's really pretty. She takes a really pretty picture with the sun going down in the back. And then the next picture is a video of a huge log floating across the water. And it was an alligator. No, a crocodile. An I don't know the difference between a crocodile and an alligator, but it was one of those. And, and they had just gotten out of the water. And I was like, Julia, you're in Texas. You're not in Sweden. You have to ask people, what is in the water? Can I do this? So I'm thankful she's alive. <laughs> and hopefully she'll be coming back to us soon. Um, yes, where am I? Uh, yes, so we lived there. We lived in Duluth for about a year and a half. And then we moved to another town in uh, Michigan, right? Uh, we lived in Michigan, we, got, we had our second daughter, and we lived there for about two years, and then we moved back to Sweden. We had our third child, Emmanuel, and we've stayed there since then, and that was 2003. So we are now in Strängnäs, and we are actually uh, leading a church plant in Strängnäs, Sweden, uh, I also wanted to tell you what I work with before I go there. Uh, I am a teacher, uh, an English teacher, of course, because I'm American. I didn't say that I was American, but I am American. And Oh, yes, maybe I did, because I said I was born in California. Um, uh, uh, so anyway, um, uh, <laughs> I'm getting off. <laughs> so I am an English teacher, and I also have um, a special ed degree, and so I work with uh, special needs students also, which I love, love, love. Brings so much joy. So we are leading a church plant in Sweden, and actually we're celebrating our fifth year uh, as a church plant. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> how excited I am about that. I really thought that, you know, I am excited because I love our church plant, but I thought by year five, you know, you make all these plans for where you're supposed to be in five years and 10 years. And I really thought that we would be an established church with 100 to 200 people, but we're not there yet. And that's the way it is. And we, we do love it. And we have actually been able to see so many things. I think there's another uh, picture. Oh, this is Ju Julia's 18th birthday party. This is this is kind of what it looks like at our house quite a bit. There were like 70 people at our house when she turned 18. About, what, 45 of them were young people. But So my kids are awesome at bringing young people to our house. So it's really cool. Uh, yes, it, here's some people from our church. Uh, we rent the, the excuse me, <clears throat> Baptist church. So um, that's some of our wonderful people. Um, so we have really experienced some really awesome things in these five years. We have seen people give their lives to Jesus. We have seen, we've been able to baptize people uh, from different countries. And I actually had another picture that I took, I took off because uh, I realized I can't show their faces. But we've had, um, we've baptized quite a, f well, a couple of people from um, Iran, Iraq, I'm so bad at that. But uh, one guy, especially uh, from Iran, I th uh, Kur Kurdistan, right? Yeah. Um, just a sweet, sweet guy. He actually, I believe he gave his life to Jesus here, right there. <laughs> or no, right over there, somewhere here. Uh, about three years ago. It, very, very cool. And then we were able to baptize him. And he was actually sent back to his home country. And that 
broke our heart, but we know that God has something amazing for him. And so it's just really cool to have been able to be a part of their, their lives. Uh, so these five years have been amazing and also some of the hardest five years of our lives. About three years ago, um, something happened to me that just, well, it would change my life forever. Um, I, well, several of you probably have either experienced it or know somebody that has experienced it or uh, feel like you might be getting there. Um, but what happened to me was a wonderful thing called burnout. Uh, also known as hitting the wall, clinical depression, nervous exhaustion, emotional collapse, neurosis, uh, nervous prostration, or crack up. Yes, crack up. No, seriously, it, it was really, really a bad time in my life. It was very, very hard. Um, I remember a time when my kids, I, was, I went into the kitchen and I was, this is before I knew I was burnt out. I, I just thought I was just irritated every, at everything and had no energy at all for anything. And I walked into the kitchen and one of my kids said, Mom, we're out of milk. And I lost it. I lost it. I didn't say a word to whichever child it was. I don't even remember. And I just ran out of my room. I ran, I mean, I ran out of the kitchen. I ran to my room. I pulled the covers over my head and I just started sobbing, just like this deep sob, you know, from inside. I couldn't stop. And Henrik comes in. He like puts his hands on me. He's like, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. They, they said that we're out of milk. <laughs> I mean, you don't react like that when you're out of milk. What is going on with me? And I actually didn't, still didn't understand, and I, <laughs> that's good, thank you. Uh, so, but I was at work also, I was still working as a, an English teacher, and I wasn't even working full time, I was working 70%, so I thought I was doing pretty good. 70% church planting, that should work. Uh, but I was at work, and one of the teachers was gonna be, she was talking to me about something I needed to do, and I'm like, I'm sorry, can you tell me again? She said it again, and I said, no, no I, you have to speak Swedish clearly. And you guys, I'm pretty good at Swedish. I'm, I would say I'm pretty, I, I'm pretty like, I'm almost fluent, I would say. But anyway, I could not understand her speaking to me. And I finally, after like five times, she tried in English, and I could not understand her. My brain was not working, and then I'm really freaking out. I cannot understand language at all, and I'm good at language. So it was pretty scary, and I did end up going to the doctor, and I ended up getting uh, diagnosed with typical teacher burnout. But it was more than typical teacher burnout, uh, and I realized that too. So I was put on sick leave for about five months, and in that time, um, I was able to well, I knew that there was wisdom out there. You know, I knew that other people have been through this. I knew there was a way out of this. And like my husband said, I'm like, I've got to, I've got to know. I've got to know. There's got to be books. There's got to be teachings. So I started searching the internet. Uh, and I found some old um, conference, uh, a, 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 I think it was a women's conference from the States. Uh, and one of the women there had gone through burnout, and she was giving her her story about how she got through it. So I couldn't read, because my brain wasn't working, but I could listen. So I bought the book that she was talking about, and I listened to it over and over and over. And uh, finally, when I was starting to feel better, then I started to try to apply these um, practices that this book was talking about to my life. Let's see where I'm at. You know, Jesus said in John 16, 33, that we are gonna have troubles in this life. And that was a trouble in my life. But he also said that we don't have to worry because he's already won, he's already defeated all of this. He's already won over all of this. And I know that I'm not alone I know for a fact that there's many of you out here that have probably experienced the same thing. And before I go any further into talking about this, I just, 
you're probably sitting here going, what in the world is she talking about? Bur why is she talking about burnout? Isn't this uh, about loving on purpose? What does burnout have to do with loving on purpose? Well, I would say good question. But before, um, before, I would, uh, before I answer that, let's just pray, okay? So Holy Spirit, we just ask you to come right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Let your will be done today, Lord. I just pray that you would um, guide my words, Lord. Let your heart come, come through me, Lord Jesus. I just pray that hearts would be healed today, that uh, you would come with your power, Father. We just invite you, Holy Spirit. Open our ears so that we can hear what you have to say to us, Lord. Thank you. <clears throat> so, how does my struggle with burnout have anything to do with loving on purpose? The first verse that I have is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I don't know about you, but I have a really hard time loving people. Daniel said that I'm a nice person and I just laughed because I'm gonna tell you some things about myself that are not so nice. Uh, I just, <laughs> I just don't have a whole lot of love in me if I'm not getting it from God. So I'll tell you one story that kind of shows you that, and it's a really embarrassing story, but I'm gonna tell it to you. So we were having a, a meeting with our core group at our house, and I don't remember when this was, but it was a while back, and I was feeling really overwhelmed. I was exhausted, I was, um, I was exhausted spiritually, physically, mentally, and I was just getting overwhelmed with everything that was coming up, questions, and how, what are we going to do, how are we going to do this, and what are we thinking here. I should have been excited, and I was just getting overwhelmed, and all these things were just coming on, on me, and, and all of a sudden, I just say, you know what, sometimes I just hate people. And this is my core group, you guys, and we're leading a church, a church plant. And I say, sometimes I just hate people, and actually, I don't even think I said sometimes. I think I just said, I just hate people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was not cute. It was not cute. It was horrible. I felt horrible. You know what our motto is for our church? It's love God, love people. And I say, <laughs> I hate people. What am I doing? What was God thinking? He must have got something wrong. How, I mean, I don't love people. <laughs> what is going on here? But you know, that, that was what was in my heart at that time. <clears throat> you know, if we want to love well, if we want to intentionally love other people, then we need to be filled with the love of God. We need to be filled with the love of God. I can't give out something that I don't have. I need to go to God first. I need to go to God and I need to say, you need to give me your love for these people. You need to fill me with your love. And we don't go to God to get filled once we're empty. We need to go there first. And then we give out. It's this rhythm we go and we get and then we give out. And we don't just stay and get and get and get. We have to give out what we've gotten. It's a flow of life. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So I'll tell you, only by the grace of God do I stand here as a church planter because he fills me with his love. <clears throat> you know, we need to start where Jesus started. And Jesus started spending time with the Father. He went away, 
He spent time with his father, and then he went out and he gave love. He went back, he spent time with the father, and he went out and he gave love. So this book that I was talking about in the beginning, uh, that this woman was teaching from or sharing how, how she helped, uh, how it helped her get, get through burnout, it's called uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. And just a little plug here, I actually didn't know it when I was gonna be speaking, but today there is gonna be a seminar by Norbert Bauer that is actually on this book. So if there's any of you that feel like, oh, I need that, you can go to his seminar or buy the book or, you know. But anyway, uh, one of the things that really struck me in this book was a story that, um, that he tells, and it's actually from another writer, but uh, he tells a story about um, a rope, <laughs> a rope that leads you home. And so I've named this talk, The Rope That Leads You Home. In his book, Peter Scazzaro tells a story of the Midwest in the United States and how there's major blizzards in the Midwest. And these blizzards, they come out from nowhere. They will just hit in a second and you never know it. And they're so strong and so hard that you can't even see your hand in front of your face. So what the farmers would do is they would tie a rope to their house and they would hold on really tight to this rope. And then they could go take care of their animals or they could go make sure everything was okay in the barn. But they had to hold really tight to this rope. And this rope had to be tied hard onto the house. And um, then they were fine. But you know, some people, they would die, seriously die, just, feet, just a couple of feet from their house from safety because they didn't have a rope tied to their home because they couldn't see anything. They couldn't see where they were gonna go. And I've actually experienced that once in Sweden when we went skiing one time with our kids. We were in Fjell, Fjell, Fjelland, I would always say, but it's called Fjellen, I think, but up in the north of Sweden. And we, we had taken this um, bandwagon, I don't know what it is, big wagon thing that takes you up to the top of the ski hill. We, got, we took it up there, we had a two-year-old and a three-year-old. I'm from Texas, I'm not very good at skiing, but I was thinking I'm gonna be a Swedish woman and I'm going to cross-country ski with my family. So we, we go up there, it's a beautiful day, it's really nice, there's a ton of people going up with us. So we turn our backs and we're fixing for the kids and you know, getting their skis on and everything and we turn around and everybody's gone. And we're like, okay, well, you know, we'll just go down by ourselves, no big deal. But all of a sudden, from nowhere, a storm hits. And we couldn't see anything. We couldn't see where the trail was. We could barely see each other, and I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, we are gonna die up here. Nobody's gonna know. We have no way to find our way home. Uh, what's gonna happen to us? We didn't end up dying, obviously. Uh, the, they actually did realize that we had come up with our kids and that we hadn't come back, so they actually sent the the um, car back up for us. It's not a car, but it's this big thing. I don't know what it is, but anyway. You get the picture. So we made it, but I can understand that, and I think a lot of you in the Nordic countries can probably understand that feeling too, that when a blizzard comes, and it's just scary if you're outside and you just don't know where you're at. So anyway, this rope, he says in this book, is a rhythm of life. It's a rhythm of life that keeps us connected to our core, to our base, to our foundation, connected to safety. Through these hard times that I experienced, I realized that I needed to create rhythms in my life that were gonna get me, keep me connected to God. I needed to have things scheduled in my life to be able to keep me connected to my safety. I needed a rope that I could guide myself back to when the storms hit, when the blizzard came. Because storms will come, blizzards will come in your life, and you're not gonna know which way to go. And you have to create rhythms in your life that you're just gonna fall back on, that you're just gonna know that rope is there, I'm just gonna continue doing this, because I know it's gonna lead me back to God. Even when you don't know, even when you don't think, he's still there. 
You know, in our Nordic countries, I've lived here a while now, uh, we're really good at making schedules. We're good at making schedules for working out. We're good at making schedules for uh, our kids, our dogs, our cats, our cars. We're good at making schedules for everything. And sometimes we need to make, put on our calendar that this day I'm going to be off. I'm going to spend it with God. This time, every day, I'm going to spend it with God. So what I'm talking about is spiritual disciplines that lead to spiritual formation. And I'm running out of time. I always talk too much. Um, Let's see, what can I hop over? So there are different spiritual, for, uh, spiritual disciplines that we can create in our lives, like um, Sabbath, uh, uh, reading the Bible. There's a ton of different things. Um, what are some of the silence and solitude? Uh, Norbert has a ton of, of ideas in his, all of his um, seminars that we can go to. But um, there's a lot of things. The things that I re that really, really, really made a difference in my life was so silence and solitude, and the Sabbath. And silence and solitude for me, I'll just tell you kind of really fast since I'm running out of time. What I what I used to what I do now, what I've created in my life. Uh, I try to get up. <laughs> try to. I'm not really good at this yet. I'm still creating this. I'm still trying to make this a, a rhythm in my life that comes naturally. But I, you know, I just put my timer on for, this is going to sound really bad, three minutes. But three minutes is a long time when you are going to sit in silence, you guys. Everything comes up in your head and you're like, oh, the laundry's there and I need to do that and I need to pick up the kids. And, and to try to get those thoughts out of your mind and just spend time with God. You know, God just wants to be with you. He wants to be with you, and he wants to be with me. So spending that time in silence. And then after that, I read my Bible. I read a Bible verse. I try to like, find something good in it, that uh, a word or a phrase that I can meditate on. I'm going to give you an example. When I find it, because now I'm having to skip over everything. See here. Actually, you know what? I talked about journaling. I did journaling also. Uh, I've actually done journaling since I was 16, uh, writing in a diary, but it's not a diary. It's a prayer book. <laughs> and it's not, it's not for everybody, but I think it's a really good thing to do. And I just write down my prayers, and I, it's very concrete, so it feels like I'm, kinda, I'm, I'm really giving them to God. Instead of just like having them here, it feels like I'm really giving them away. And it's actually also a good thing because I have it written. And so my prayers are written down, and I see when God answers them, and I can come back to them, and I can read them again, and I can say, oh, God answered that. And uh, this happened, or my heart changed, and I'm not mad at that person anymore because God did this. And it's just a really cool thing. So like in my marriage, uh, there's probably none of you that have problems in your marriage, but I have problems in my marriage. And so when Henrik and I got married, I wrote a ton because I was so scared. I was not supposed to meet somebody. And I wrote a ton of things down, and I asked God, uh, you know, God, can you, can you just show me that this is the right person for me? And he answered all of these prayers. So now, when I feel like kicking him out of the house, <laughs> I go back to my diary, or my prayer book, and I read, and I go, okay, God, there was something here, <laughs> even though it doesn't feel like it right now, and I know that you're in this. So I'll keep on, I'll keep on. And then I write that prayer down too. <laughs> so I've really gotten off, you guys. And I'm actually not gonna go into Sabbath and solitude because you can, you can read about that in books and you can go to seminars even here and hear about it. But what I want to tell you is, you know what? <clears throat> There's a ton of stuff for us to do. There is so much that we can do. There's so much we can do in the world. There's so many people we can help. There's uh, so many people that need love. 
but we really, really, really have to go to God first. We really need to concentrate on our relationship with God too and not, not only be focused outward. I'm not saying not to be focused outward, but we have to, have to, have to have a base. And I think for me, my base was not very secure. Even though I knew God, I thought I knew God, I think I know God, there, there was just, uh, I didn't have that rhythm that brought me back. And I don't want you to think at all that this is like a rule, you have to do this, God's not gonna love me, I'm not gonna get anywhere if I don't do this. You know what, this is an invitation. God is giving you an invitation to know him, to have a relationship with him, and I mean a deep relationship with him where he like, he talks to you and he pours out his love to you. And I do wanna tell you one thing, when I was having silence and solitude one day, um, it was actually before that those 70 people came for Julia's birthday party, and I didn't have time really to sit there and have this time with God, but I did it because it, it's my routine, and I wanted to continue with my routine. So as I'm having this time, uh, you know, my three minutes were over, and I'm like reading my Bible verse, and I'm like, okay, okay, now I can go. But God said to me, Christina, do you want to hear what I have to say to you? And I'm like, ah, that's just my voice. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll see if it's you. Go, okay, go ahead. What do, you, what do you have to say? And I'm telling you, God poured out his love on me like I haven't felt in a long time. He poured out his love on me, and he started telling me all the things he loves about me, and he started telling me, you know, you are supposed to speak at camp because I was really scared. And I was like, this is not right, God. You, you've chosen the wrong person. They had it wrong when they asked me. And God's going, no. I love you, and he's pouring out his love on me. And then all of a sudden, I see us on a walk, and I see God and me, or Jesus and me, we're just, we're just walking, and we're on this love walk. And I start feeling like sorry for everybody else that's around that's not on this love walk with Jesus. But then I start seeing other people on this love walk with Jesus. And you know what, I didn't get jealous, and I'm a jealous person, you guys. I'm a, if you know what the Enneagram is, I'm a four on the Enneagram, and we're full of envy. <laughs> so I, but I was happy for these people that they were on this love walk with Jesus. And you know what? Jesus wants to go on a love walk with you. He wants to pour out his love on you. He wants to fill you with his love so that you can go out and love other people, so that you can love on purpose. And we have to be intentional we have to do this on purpose to be filled with God's love so that we can then be intentional about loving other people. So I'm gonna end here and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask you guys, you know, um, if there's anybody here that just feels tired and burned out, I actually have one last verse. It's from the message. It starts with, are you tired? Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I think that Jesus just really wants to invite you into this relationship with him. And I, I'm not just saying those of you that don't know him yet and aren't in a relationship with him. Yes, he wants you to come and have a relationship with him. But even those of you that know Jesus, He's calling you into a deeper relationship with him. And so I just wanna ask, just real fast, because we don't have a whole lot of time, if there's anybody here that feels burnt out, that feels tired and ready to give up, uh, if you would just like to stand, I would like to pray for you. Just a simple prayer, and then we can go on to our cap coffee. 
I just really feel like God just wants to pour out his love on you. He just wants to pour out his love on you.